data visualizer. So basically, what is data visualization? This is a very new trend nowadays and it is in fashion totally. So something is there, data visualization, and it is something we'll discuss in this presentation. So now the next, uh, why we need data visualization? Now this is one big question, why? Because there are people who will be saying that we have Excel, we have spreadsheets, and we have tabular columns. Why? Why don't we need? Why do we need data visualization? So we'll get the answer in the next few slides. So let's begin this uh, with three easy questions. The first question here is like how many numbers are above hundred? And I'll give you some ten seconds to find it out. So let's wait for some ten seconds. So just find how many numbers are above hundred. All right, so next go to the next slide. How many numbers are below 10? So I guess 10 seconds are up. So next go to the third question. So here we have divided the numbers into four quadrants. So which quadrant is having the highest total? I hope you might be able to answer those questions, but let's make the things a little bit easier by using few simple visual cues. So the same thing, what I have done is highlighted the numbers which are above 100. So now we can easily make it out that there are six numbers which are more than 100. But in the earlier uh, previous slide, it was very difficult to figure out how many numbers are above 100. Now let's go to the next thing. Yeah, now how many are below 10? So we can see here easily like seven are there which are below 10. So which was uh, very difficult in the earlier slide and now 10. So here we have used a gradient, something white to green. So the quadrant having more number of green slots over there. So those are like bigger numbers. So easily we can make out there is a close competition between second, uh, sorry, second and the fourth quadrant. So basically four quadrants is the winner here because we are having more number of green blots over there. So in the earlier, let's go to the previous slides once again and let's view what happens there. Now this is how many are 100. It was pretty easy. Now here below 10 the same thing here and the quadrant part. So unless and until sum of all the numbers are uh, have a closer look on the all the quadrants, it is very difficult to figure it out. But with the visual clues, it's pretty easy. So this is how we could say that how visual things are very uh, easy for the humans to understand. This is something like we have been doing like visually people used to think since thousands of years old like early men say and all. So we are very much trained to understand the visual representation better than numbers and all. Because numbers and all we have been trained in the past 20 years, 30 years since our childhood that is 1, 2, 3 and 4. So based, uh, other than numbers, we will be very much comfortable on uh, visual. So that this is why I think that visualization is very much important for any kind of data. If it is a huge amount of data which cannot be consumed normally using tabular columns or any spreadsheets or something, so that can be easily maintained, uh, like represented in various types of visuals. So we will see what are the types of visuals in our latest slide. So let's move on to next thing. So I think this this is clear why we should go for visualization just with a simple clue. So if this is a problem here for with, uh, with not more than 100 numbers here. So what will happen if we are doing dealing with some kind of industry problems where we have a lot of millions of records and billions of records, how to analyze? Humans can't do, even in computers if we are doing those things, a lot of errors will come. Errors in the sense like uh, normal calculations, things and all will be okay. But once it comes to consuming those things, how to apply it in business so that it will be very much beneficial in future or whatever the deadlock conditions business is facing that could be recovered. So visually it's very easy to understand. So now let's see few of the case studies what we did in Graminer. Okay, now look at the sales figure. Now we have four different cities of 
uh, like uh, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, and New York. So for uh, span of January till November, we have price and sales for all the four cities. So if we look at the average of each city, it is like nine, and even uh, sorry, the yeah, average price of all the cities is nine point zero, and if you see the sales, it is seven point five zero. So it is same for all. Rather, even if the figures are different in the table, the average is same. So if we are looking with the general conclusion using average, mean, and all those things, that is not going to help in all the cases. Here we can say, okay, it's good for our overall period, but they, it might not be good for a particular month or something. So how to figure it out? We'll see in the next slide. So the, as of now, we are having average. So average is something same. We have variance. That is also same here. Oh, so these four are like identical, but let's see what happens next. Now, yeah. Now the same numbers has been plotted into a chart. Now this plot is uh, this type of chart is basically called a scatter plot. So here, if you see, x axis represents the price and y sales. So it's something like price to sales ratio, something we are doing. So if you see the first one, the case study for Boston, it's something if the price increases. Sometimes it goes up and uh, sometimes down. But on an average, if you see, uh, with the increase of price, the sales goes up. So this is something like generally, if you see something regularity like up and down, it is something like with increase in price, it is uh, sales is increasing. So price is directly proportional to sales. We can say here. Now we look at Chicago. Here the price is increasing. Then sales also get increased, but up to a certain limit. There will be a threshold, so uh, there is a breaking point over here, something around 8 or 8, 8 point something, so 8 to 9. So there the breakdown comes and the sales is like getting decreased even if the price is increasing. So there is something we can, how, what we can do, what we can do with all this data after we finish this, we'll come to that. So next is Detroit. Now if you see Detroit here, uh, if the price increases, everything goes fine till 8, till price is 8.0. So once it crosses that, it comes down suddenly. So again, in one stage after 14 or something, the sales goes pretty high. So that might be something like uh, some stock might not be available. Suddenly it's available or something. People are looking for some new uh, product in the market. Now I'll tell you how to utilize this thing. Now if you look at New York, it is something economically very balanced, we can say. The price remains constant and the sales is increasing or decreasing. So price is constant here, so we can say that New York is having a pretty good economy. And there is a case in New York where the price is something beyond 18 or something around 18 and the sales gets increased. Now let's move back to uh, move to the previous slide and see why this is happening. So if you see for Boston, sales is something the price 10, 8, 13 and something. And sales is like 5, 6. 5.8.4, uh, 6.95 and all this. Now if you look at New York, same thing here, the price remains constant unless uh, only for August it is like 19.0. Now we can make out in the next slide that New York, this uh, outlier is something which is created due to that row. Now how to consume this? Now we have plotted, now we know that which is stable, which is not stable, which is working with city and why it is not working. Now, let's take an example of Chicago, because Boston is something like uh, something is happening over there, so it's up and down. So we need to figure it out why it is happening, why this unusual behavior is there. But Chicago, we can easily make it out that after a certain price range, the sales goes down. And that is something around 10. So let's move back to the previous slide and see where in Chicago 10 is available. So 10 is something in Jan and around 11 is in like Ma May. So anything going beyond that, that is June or we can say September, all this and even March. So the sales goes down. So now what might be the case? Let's take few of the case. There are some products like seasonal products, once which is getting uh, like removed from the stores and all, the sales are good, uh, getting down. Second thing it might be that people are not willing to spend something if it goes beyond a certain limit. So mostly the salesperson needs to take care uh, if the price is increasing. Uh, so they should monetize all those things and increase in certain way so that it won't affect the sales. So this is how they can go ahead with. And New York is like pretty stable, but there are cases in the 
same price, the sales goes down. Now, if I look why the sales goes down in New York table, so here if you look at this one, the sales uh, the price remains same 8.0 other than August. So here the sales goes down for uh, September, we can say, then Feb, we can say, and then July. So Feb, July, and September. So this is something like uh, maybe some seasonal product might be there or something like uh, some kind of uh, uh, like uh, March and all we can say that there is some holiday time or something so it might be affected so need to figure out based on uh, their own like uh, US based things how they are working and what are their holiday calendars and all so this can be consumed in such a way. Now uh, we can easily identify what benefits we got through this simple visual this is a simple scatter plot so it is something the table which is showing same average and variance is having so much of insights within that. So even this is one part we can do further more analysis on this if we go for the different charts based on something products and all which product is creating problems and all those stuff. So that is a huge thing. So this is a basic intro system. So I'll be concentrating more on intro part. Now let's move on to the next one. Okay. Now this is something a uh, data trained. Okay. So we have uh, trends over the market. So based on like first one, if you, if you can see transaction data. So increasing data being churned out systems in information higher. So basically now we know that we are in an information technology. So anything not connect, uh, anything now is connected to information technology. Something like we are having even a small business is having websites. They have their own online stores. Why many e-commerce and all of the things. So everyone is pumping out data somewhere might be in cloud, might be in their own server, but ultimately it is getting, sorry, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, so everyone is like pumping out data somewhere in their own hard drive or cloud or somewhere, but all these data is being connected somewhere, like it's being connected everywhere so that making use of the, these data. So basically these are the transactional data. So if you see the trend line, this chart is basically called a trend line or a spark line. So basically it's showing trends, so we call it as a, a trend line. So if you see the trend from 2000 to 2011, uh, till 2000 till 2003, the very gradual increase was there. Very small, like little bit of increment was there. But after 2003 till 2011, there is a, a very huge growth. So this is something like uh, after 2003, uh, Facebook came into the market, lot of social media and lot of banks and all moved to online, uh, like online portals and all those stuff. And even if you see after 2006, we uh, like uh, Android phones and all these uh, smartphones are introduced. So due to all this, like everyone who are not using any kind of internet or any kind of uh, like uh, uh, online stuff are coming into online market. They are getting connected with people and based on everything. So the data size gets increased. Now let's see. Uh, next, as a social network data. So, if we look at uh, the social network data till 2000 to two, uh, 2004. So, since that time, uh, Facebook was not very popular. So, it was launched in somewhere around 2003, I guess. So, I'm not sure. It's around 2003 only. 2000 and all, Orkut and all those things were there. So, it was like somewhat going good, but not as after 2004. Because in India, I think people started using Facebook. Uh, and even worldwide, it's after 2004 only because that was the uh, proper commercial launch date. And not only Facebook, lot of other stuffs came like Twitter and all those many social uh, social media came. So the social, sorry. Yeah. Uh, any problem, Joy? Yeah. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Or is there any problem? Uh, like, can you hear me? Okay, fine. So, let's start. Okay. So, we are in social network data. So, basically, uh, after Facebook came, lot of other social media came and this uh, increased the social network data. Now, M2M data is something like not very common. M2M is something like one device to device data. But now if you see the trend line here, it's like from 2000 to 2011, it gets like a drastic increase, more than any kind of transaction data, any social network data and all this. 
So this we can say that something uh, many devices were there even after 2005 we can say a lot of wearable devices came which gets interacted with the smartphones and laptops via Bluetooth and all and pump in a lot of data. So many things came. Now if we look at after 2010 everything is like now smart uh, smartphones uh, like connected via smartphones and all. So all those things portable devices are generating a lot of data. So this is one thing and so now the interesting part here is storage cost, bandwidth cost, and processing cost. Now, if you look at 2000, the storage storage cost. If you are like, if I, uh, sorry. Okay, so here uh, we can see the storage cost. If you look at a uh, few years back, like 10, 15 years back, 15 years back. So the hard disk was like. But if you talk less than a TB now, it's really a shame. So we can say in the same price model, what for, for uh, being uh, sold at that time is now being sold for one, uh, one TB is being sold in the same price range. So something we can say that the storage cost increased. So this we can easily make out with the flash drive also. Now, now 16 GB around three to 400 for so all those things. Now if bandwidth also if you previously very few people used to have internet in their home. So I remember my childhood days, I used to go to cafe, cyber cafe and all and use those things. But now it's something like we are having internet on our fingertips via our smartphones and all and the cost of these things got drastically decreased. So it's fine now. So this this is what this trend line shows. Now processing cost also, so machines are also very much low cost uh, nowadays. So previously if a system was like 50,000, now we can get a machine for 20,000 and even the capability is pretty uh, like high as compared to the previous one. So these are the like known facts what we know. So just I plotted these things and uh, shown in a trending form. So to visualize. Now, the same scenario, let's imagine in a tabular for, uh, form. So we are having a table with all the transitional data because transitional data will be having something billions and trillions of rows. So no way we can analyze using normal human naked, uh, naked human eyes. Okay, leave these human eyes. Uh, if, even if we are having computer, we need a lot of processing parts. So it's something like we are doing some kind of groups, right? We are grouping by based on years and all and plotting it here. So it reduces the data size and if consumption gets very uh, easy for the end user, second thing we, we need very less computing power to process all these things because instead of like if suppose we take an example like in a year if uh, 1000 uh, records are getting generated this is just an example it will be very high so i need for 10 years for 10 years of data i need around 1000 into 10 so it will be 1 lakh so 1 lakh records i need to process now if i am doing groups i am dividing like based on year i am uh, uh, showing here so i need only uh, one row for a particular year so basically if i want to show for 10 years so i need 10 rows so it will be very less so this is how visualization helps us now let's move on to the next slide and see okay now this is one of the interesting one and my favorite so here we can see uh, all Indian batsmen, uh, we have plotted here based on like box. So this is basically called a tree map. So tree map is something like the box which is like having maximum size uh, is the player who has scored more number of runs here. So no doubt Sachin Tendulkar is the top. Second we can see Saurav Ganguly, Rahul Dravid, Mohammad Dajruddin, then Yura Singh and so on. Now here you can see the size of boxes is one thing what is depicting the number of runs scored by the associated uh, cricketer here and second thing is there is a gradient color gradient so it is something like dark gray, uh, red uh, light green and dark green and all all those things so basically red dark green and green green means very good red is worst so anything between green and red that will be yellow here so basically here is the ryg scale red yellow to green so green is good and red is bad here so anything in between means average so here green is something if you look at virender sevaks it is like uh, having a higher uh, green set so we know that virender sevak is a attacking batsman and plays uh, like uh, uh, over the strike rate of 100 and all so Brenda Sehwag is having more green, then we can say Sachin Tendulkar, Yuraj Singh and all. Even though we know that Sachin Tendulkar don't play very much attacking 
shots in uh, like uh, normally but he is having more number of innings in his hand or uh, any uh, like more than any other player in indian cricket team or uh, ex cricketers so he is having green because uh, on an average it will be like uh, strike rate will be something uh, equivalent to virendra sehwag and all but he, here we can see virendra sehwag is having the more dark shade of green so let's go to the more granular level how and why this is happening so let's move on to the second uh, next slide okay now here if you look at we are having india odi batting now sachin tendulkar again one uh, like one cricketer's career is divided into further blocks so further another one tree map is there within another uh, tree map one leaf node so here sachin uh, the first bigger block in sachin tendulkar's uh, uh, one is like 200 against south africa in 2010 now uh, it is one thing now if you look at uh, where is virendra sehwag yeah so virendra sehwag he is having sehwag's 146 against sri lanka in 2009 so that is uh, with a uh, within a very less uh, with uh, like he didn't took a lot of balls to score that so the shade is green so now we can visualize which is the inning for sachin tendulkar or any other player so who is uh, when he scored with a very high scoring rate very high strike rate and when it's less now we can now how to consume this this is one thing now we understood this so if this is being used by any of the uh, like uh, bcci member or any coach and all they can come to know which are the bowlers and which are the team against whom one player is not playing well or playing well both these things now in the training events and all if someone is not able to play spins this is mostly hap- uh, mostly happens with uh, uh, attacking players like virendra sehwag and all they are not good players of spin so we can say that okay he is not a good player of spin so let's give more practice on that so these kind of things are there which can be done and even uh, one cricketing expert can make out more uh, than what i can do in this so next uh, okay now this is one of the interesting thing now this is tamil nadu 2010 marks and uh, we have plotted it in basis that how many students are getting passed and what are the like uh, average ranges so if you look at the number of students so it is something around 17 to 18000 we can say okay so now there is a between 30 to 35 there is very uh, in 35 sorry 35 there is a spike so all of a sudden how 34 there are many people who are getting failed in 34 33 33 34 and all but in 35 there are many people who are like that there is a spike so there are most of the people who are passing is scoring like 35 or 36 like that so there is a huge spike over there and gradually it goes on decreasing so normally as it happens like one will get a very less people will get 100 and all like more than 95 so this is what general behavior so that is fine now here there is a spike something 35 uh, is showing so it might be like one who is getting 34 and is very close enough like one or two marks teachers might be giving some grace marks and making them pass so this is this might be one case happening here now let's see for social science now this is a weird case over here so in 35 around 35 students are there so sorry 35000 are getting 35 marks so this is something like very weird so how these many students are getting 35 now if you look at the graph here it's 30 to 35 very less people uh, 35 we are having a uh, very huge spike but 30 to 34 uh, it's very less or even 34 i don't think uh, any uh, like any student is there in, in that range so it is something whoever gets around 30 will get 35 like the pass marks so this is something like uh nobody will fail if they are scoring around 30 so either teachers will make pass or the question pattern is like that like if something questions are there like two marks four marks and all if one attempts a four marks question definitely he'll be coming from 30 to 34 directly or if he scores 31 definitely he'll be coming to 35 so if attempted that particular question so these patterns might be there so it might be based on teacher who is making them pass or it's something like four marks questions are there six marks questions are there so that might be affecting uh, this pattern like uh, if one scores uh, if one attempts a question fully correctly so he'll be going to the next 
next level directly not like one or two marks increment fully five or six marks increment so this might be happening with social science now there is a uh, like uh, language paper so language paper if you see everything goes fine very few people are failing within like 35 there is no such spike in 35 also we can see there is a slight movement in 36 so that is something like regular but if you look at the reason after 70 so 70 till uh, we can say around 90 so there are a huge number of students who are between 70 to 90 so this is something like high scoring paper we can say so the very less people will uh, will be failing here so most of the people will not struck in like boundary cases like 33 34 and 35 because we can see uh, not much are there so it might be like 35 is getting some 36 so a little bit of spike is there in 35 uh, th sorry 36 so something is there and then it goes on increasing till 90 90s we can say so after that it gets decreased so this is something very uh, normal usual behavior so in language uh, very less people fail so this is something okay now we will, if we look at science now again like social science this is also showing a weird pattern so first i thought this is this might be some data error but uh, this is not it is there in data now if you look at 35 uh, students are getting 35 so many students like more than 35000 around uh, 37000 36000 something so huge number of students are getting 35 so why it is so again the same explanation it might be like five or six marks questions is there if one is attempting from 30 he'll be directly jumping to 35 so that might be one case so uh, basically i don't belong to tamil nadu board so i don't know that what is the pattern over there but mostly uh, in science what happens like six marks questions are there and two marks questions are there so one big question got attempted if one has got 30 already and one big question it will clear him from uh, like uh, getting the pass marks so this is fine for science so there is a huge spike so we can say that a lot of people are there who are just getting pass marks in science we can say so people are not good in science as like language and all so that is not a even growth we can say and if you see 100 in science so it is uh, now we can say that it is not very difficult to score 100 marks in science uh, because in 100 we are having around 5000 to 6000 people so five to six thousand students is pretty good enough to get a sent up marks. So it's something like, uh, sorry, uh, full marks. So hundred marks we are, uh, people are getting here. So that's pretty cool. Now for mathematics, even it is higher than science. So forty thousand students are getting pass marks, just pass marks. So this is like not very uncommon. We know that in uh, most of the students are very much afraid of mathematics. So the people who are getting around 29 or 30 might be jumping directly or teachers are making them pass somehow uh, by giving some grace marks here and there one or two marks and after like if someone is getting like 34 and half will be rounded to 35 so those kind of things so somehow it is coming to 35 so with this chart we can clearly make it out like mathematics is one paper which is mathematics science and social science these are the three papers where just pass marks uh, getting a pass marks is difficult for the students so this is one thing now if we look at 100 there is again one spike around uh, 13 to 14,000 so this is pretty good we can say now one insight we can take it out from here is like one is uh, one can score 100 marks easily in mathematics if he is very much thorough with all these concepts so that is fine because we all know that uh, in mathematics if you get the answer and if your procedure is correct nobody can uh, detect any marks so that is one thing so no theory and all no explanation no long answers is needed only point to point things so it's pretty easy to get 100 marks over there cool so let's go to the next slide now this is again total marks and all now I'll not waste much time on this I want to show some practical demos so I'll just move on with these slides so total marks for class 12 students so it is something like uh, most of the students are getting around 80 percent and all so those spikes are okay then a lot of students are there like we can say that mostly people are getting first uh, from 58 or 59 there is a huge uh, like increase in that bar so basically this is a bar chart i forgot to tell this and and if you see 55 56 and 57 nobody is scoring those uh, like nobody is in this uh, that particular region so there might be some cases like uh, where one is getting like 57 56 percent 
so if we round for all the things it is coming to something around 60% or even more than that so some cases might be there or based on some patterns in the question papers like one or two marks and all those things making them score directly in even numbers like 58 or 60 62 like that so it might be the case okay now in english this is pretty weird we can say now if you look at the number here so around 33 so 33 is the pass marks now this is cbse uh, so here pass marks is 33 so 33 huge spike and again in 95 huge spike now 95 i know one reason even though like uh, how much well your, your paper goes doesn't matter like getting 100 is very difficult in english and uh, language paper so people will stick around some 95 96 and all so here 95 is something like teachers resist themselves so 95 is the one which will be allotted to the student if he has written something paper like equivalent to 100 marks so if someone is like extraordinary so some 96 97 percent so most of the students who are very good will be getting something around 95 percent that is on an average you can say and 33 percent people are also there more than 40,000 so that is a pretty huge amount so nobody fails in english since if the person is scoring around more than something 25 to 32 so within that range nobody fails so no data is there so this is one for english so all these are like basic distribution i will not waste much time on this so this is something we can see here for physics so again physics average is like 95 so which is having some huge uh, spike over there and if you look at the uh, average thing what average students are scoring is around 48 or something around 50 till 60 so 50 to 60 is like average marks all right now there is one interesting thing fraud detection in energy utility so this is something meter reading nowadays even now we are having normal meters who, which will be plotted in our house with electricity connected to it and uh, there will be a person who will be coming to take reading every month or like to, uh, every two two months and all he'll be collecting the readings and giving the bill so this is how it works now if you look at the uh, spikes here and there so this is like uh, for tamil nadu this also now if you look at these uh, there is a slab system okay i'll tell you what is uh, how this works so if one is having meter reading from 1 to 100 units he'll be charged uh, based on a different rate if anything increases from like 100 units it's like 101 to 200 he'll be charged at a different rate so meaning if one is like uh, having a meter reading of 0 to uh, sorry 1 to 100 so he'll be some charge around suppose 1 rupee so if the person exceeds to 101 unit so he'll be charged at around 2 rupees for the all units it's not like first 100 will be charged at 1 rupee no the new rate will be applied to the complete slab now if you look at this 100 unit slab is pretty big and even 50 unit slab is pretty big now the thresholds the slabs 200 150 100 300 are big so one thing uh, here one question why it is so are people perfectly monitoring their slabs that within uh, the meter should stick to 100 only or 150 or these slabs or there might be something like uh, meter spoofing and all those people might be doing which will uh, stop the meter once it reaches to 100 or like permanently stop the meter something or there are some bribing uh, they are bribing the reading person and like asking them to put it within the 100 sla slabs the, within that slab only so this is something like uh, very uncommon so one can't be 100 all the time and even if you see 90 80 75 70 60 40 all these are like round number if i ask you to put any number between 1 to 100 so and like it's something like slab system or something so people usually write in a rounded form 90 85 80 90 nobody is going to write as 96 or 93 it's very uncommon so if you see here here also same thing happens so all the 10 20 30 40 all these tens digits so these numbers are having spikes over there and others are not having any spikes so this is what we can make out from this okay now let's go to the next slide okay now election here this is a simple uh, india map so basically this is called as something as a cartogram or nowadays we are having we are using leaflet map for this so it is something like what google uses like google map and all so here this is a political map all the cities has been divided and there are color coded like color codes are there so bjp is having some red 
So BASP corresponding colors are there, which can be seen easily on the labels over there. Now, we know that INC is something like here, blue color is INC, that is uh, Indian National Congress and BJP. So there was a close fight between these two. So INC won by very minor uh, difference. So 145 was scored by INC and BJP scored 138. Now if we look at the maps, so there are two major players looking here, two major major colors we can say. One is like uh, red color, that is something around brown, that is for BJP. Second one is INC Indian National Congress, that is blue. And if you see small, small green and here were like uh, spots like BSP, CPM, so those are very few. Now we, we can easily understand that there is a very, very close fight between uh, blue and this uh, red color. So something like BJP and INC. So we can make out like uh, since it is a very low difference, like 145 and 138, only seven states difference is there. So we can say that, okay, fine, INC won here. So we need to see which state is having some more seats and also like that uh, it won't. So this is what India map says. Now, uh, I'll be showing all these things in live demo. So basically, uh, these things are created on browsers. Whatever visuals we create, we create on browser. So there is a, uh, okay, let's go to the basic things and directly we'll see. Okay, now this is a basic IPython notebook. So here we can do any kind of Python calculus. So let's take a new IPython notebook. Okay. So when we install Anaconda, it comes automatically or separately you can install with uh, like there is a model for this. So I want to do some kind of Python calculus or some, suppose print something. So I am printing here, hello world. Okay, we got a hello world print. Okay, one second. Sorry, I forgot to share the screen. No, else. Okay. Is my screen visible? Can anyone ping me? Yes, okay, cool. Now, this is a simple IPython notebook. So when you install Anaconda package, so IPython notebook comes separately or you can install Python in this model so to get the IPython notebook. Simple, we can do any kind of Python calculations here. So this is what we know. Suppose I want to print hello world. All right, I did something. Okay, now I got, I executed it here. So this is something which can be hosted in GitHub also in future for future reference and all those things. So we can execute the code and get the output here itself in the HTML web page. This is fine. Now I'll tell you how to run HTML CSS and JavaScript. So the complete web application, you can develop it here. I'm telling, why I'm saying here, because I'll be using Python for development. So all the processing will be done in Python and it will be passed to some kind of JavaScript library. So there are many JavaScript libraries, one is D3 or Dimple or uh, Vega, all those libraries are there. There are plenty of libraries. You can uh, Google it and get all those names. So one of which I love is like D3 and Vega. So here, this is one, like we can uh, do any kind of print, uh, like uh, any kind of Python operations, or suppose I want to print something like uh, in Python, suppose one to five, so just do print of X. Okay, so I got zero to four number, fine. Now, how to use HTML here? So there is a module in IPython display, import HTML. So we need to do from IPython.display import HTML. Now, uh, whatever we write in HTML, right? should go within this triple quotes. Okay, so it should be within this. So I'm just for example, I'm doing this. Okay. Now, now I'm commenting the CSS in JS. I'll tell you how it affects. Okay. Now, this HTML is a function and we need to pass the variable which is having the HTML content. Okay. So HTML is the name of the, uh, name of the variable which is storing this. Now if I print this one, I'll be getting black color hello world. Suppose I want to add any kind of style to this, I just enable this CSS and I need to concatenate this using a plus symbol. So now HTML plus CSS I want to display. So basically what I have done is here, H1, I have colored it to red. So by default it will come in black as of now what we can see. Now if I run this, now it is in red. It's perfect, working. Now, three things what we need for development of any kind of web application. The four things is HTML for designing. CSS for adding styles to it and JS for adding uh, client-side validations or any kind of interactions and all those. Okay. So, and we know that Python already runs in IPython notebook. So that is not an issue. So we have the entire thing in one uh, yes, framework here. Okay, other than this, we have a lot of frameworks which can be used. One is Tornado, Flask, or Django, 
and lot more so this is one thing okay so now i want to see uh, append this hello world with a welcome word so just i have uh, enabled the js variable and now in js i have appended selected that uh, h1 using a selector and append as welcome uh, append welcome so it's simple i am getting welcome over here fine now let's do these things uh, one chart creation using d3 so d3 is a library which requires jquery for execution and d3 is having their uh, its own js so what i have done here is i have called a http library link so here i have a link this is d3 dot uh, d3 js dot org from there we can define version and so that the size will be a little bit less second thing we need a jquery so before we execute uh, d3 library or call d3 library we need to have jquery model imported so that is why i have imported jquery before now so for creating any web application for example i need html css js that, that is what i said in my previous uh, slide uh, not slide actually uh, no book now here so what i have done is the first thing i have created a html division so id is like visualization i have given the width and height of that and added some kind of css to it now okay i will do full screen okay now i have a data bar chart data now x i have given as 1 y is 5 x is 20 y is 20 x 40 y 10 and so on okay this is the bar chart data i have given second thing now this is how we declare uh, any uh, chart in d3 you can say okay now what i am doing i have to select the place where i want to display that particular chart so if you remember in the first line itself we have given uh, the division ideas visualization so i am not able to move it okay it's not cool one sec so something happened it's not fair. okay fine so the div, uh, so the division name is visualized so i am calling that id and selecting that particular thing and assigning to a variable with and assigning few of the attributes over here now assigning the scale how it's a scale because the number might not be always very small if the number is something around 1000 and all you won't be able to display so you need to scale it accordingly so here i am doing the ordinary scaling and next you see x and y scale i have done here now we need to set the axis uh, axis of the horizontal lines we can see it in the visual later and uh, all these appending and all these charts and everything is prepared now by the end again now all these things are done in javascript because d3 is a javascript library so all the things uh, chart creation and everything goes in javascript so javascript does all these things now css we can add some styling and you know, color and all those things for division or any other part you can do it in css ultimately this js is creating some kind of html that is called as svg svg is something is color vector graphic so i'll show you in the later stage how and why now if i execute this see i got here a bar chart so based on data i got this one so 5051 20 20 it was like that right so I got here. Now, if you see here, this particular block, this particular bar, it's not a normal division or it's like some kind of a graphics item, right? So this is called a SVG, scalar vector graph. So if we inspect element over here, do I inspect, inspect element? It is a rectangle, okay? We'll see it later, how to do it without using any kind of line range. So this is, I'm using a rectangle over here. So this is what D3 does internally, but by the end, uh, we are passing only data and all those things there. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, similarly, I have created a multi-line. So this is called a multi-line chart. So multi-line, uh, there I have passed the data in normal JSON format directly to the chart. Here I have used the CSV. So basically this CSV is part one dot CSV is a CSV file that I have kept in a data directory in mind. So if I print that one, df spark one, after reading the CSV using Python, so Pandas is a library, basically here I use Pandas. So Pandas is a library to do many kind of data manipulations on top of data frames in form of data frames and various other features to provide to handle the data and all. So here if you see the uh, table structure, we are having sale and year. So basically sale is 200 for 2000 and so on. Now, we know that D3 needs any kind of input not in a table format, not in any data frame format. It has to be in a dictionary format. So basically it's a JSON format, what, it, what JavaScript supports. 
So we call it a dictionary in Python, assuming that it's similar, like in JSON is called in Java. So if you, so what I did here, here I've converted uh, that one to JSON format uh, using the orient equals to records. So why I use records because I want uh, cell as 150 and all this like this. So record uh, row by row address. So now the uh, conversion is something like cell equals to this and all I got in a JSON format. Now the same data I pass to data one for the first spark line and data two for the second spark line. And similarly, uh, all the provisions follow just like a bar chart. Now I got here two uh, lines you can say. So this is a spark line. So multi line basically. So two lines are there. So multi, multi line. So now we can say if suppose this is a sale for one particular year, so blue for example is showing for current year and for uh, one is for uh, red is for previous year, we can easily see from here when it is like going down or when it is like same, like the intersection point is like both are having same kind of sale. So uh, sorry, uh, in between, uh, like price is same and uh, price is same and when it is intersecting, a lot of insights we can get through this. So in terms of development, we can use a lot of libraries. I used here day three to do uh, this. Now let's move on to the crude way how day three is doing internally for any JavaScript library. So this, these are the few uh, we can say SVG elements. These are the few SVG elements. So what is SVG? SVG is a graphic that browser supports. So it is something scalar vector graphic. And uh, so basically few core things are rectangle. So the first one we can see here is a rectangle. We can even fill that this one. So here fill is transparent. If I fill something here, something fill red. So see, uh, second one got filled. So first one if I need to fill, so I can fill with blue. So a lot of things can be done here. Lot of attributes are there. Lot of properties can be done with this. Okay. Now circle is there. Ellipse is there. Then polyline and uh, polygon path and all. So basically, whenever we create a bar chart, it is basically a rectangle. Okay, and if you create something as a scatter plot or something, it is basically a circle that is a bubble. And if you create anything like connection, like multi line sparks and uh, those things you saw, right? So that is basically a path. Uh, the last element we can see the blue color thing. So this is a path. So basically, this path is only used here in D3 to create the multi line. If you look closely here, uh, not this one, okay. yeah, this one, it's the same thing path over here. So this is how internally it is done. So all these steps you can see, you can create any object. I have seen minions and all people are creating even CSS or even steps VGA it is possible. Now, uh, yeah. So this is what I have created a bar chart, simple using rectangles and all. I'll tell you, uh, I already explained that how to integrate with HTML, CSS, JavaScript and Python can easily be executed in uh, IPython console uh, notebook. So it is perfectly fine. Now, basically if you look at the data here, I have data. 4729. Okay, 4729. Uh, this is like for plotting the axis. I use the reason being uh, I by the notebook takes the coordinate from top bottom, the uh, top corner, okay, top left corner. So if I'm plotting, it will be inverted all the time. So I rotated it to make it uh, like uh, uh, simple here. So I used a two data frame. One is for naming, that is in reverse order. So I have reversed it to data dot reverse here. And data f is like used for plotting. So, okay. Now this is the data frame we are having. So this is basically a list we have. So we have data as 4, 7, 2 and 9. So let's plot a simple bar graph, not without using any kind of library, just by using our loops and HTML, uh, sorry, uh, SVG. So I've created a, uh, so SVG is having four attributes basically. X is the X coordinate, X position. Y is the Y position of that. So here I don't use any Y. So Y I am not defining here. Width, width is the width of that particular thing, uh, rectangle and height. So basically here, if you look at this one, based on data, the height changes, the width remains the same. So what I'm doing, I'm enumerating based on this list, data underscore F. So X will give me the uh, current element. So like it will be like four, seven, two and nine. I will be the position of that particular element. So it will be like zero, two, one, uh, zero, one, two, three, like that. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, I am multiplying X with 10. So 10 because the number is very small, so the four pixel and all those things will be very small, right? If I don't do this one, so the value will be very small. To make it visible, I'm scaling this, okay? I'm multiplying by a constant 10. So it's like somewhat visible, we can make it out how, what's the difference and all those stuff. And this is what I'm doing. Next is I'm adding that text. 
So in the same HTML, I'm keep on appending different different uh, like elements of HTML normal SVG elements here. So basically, first I have done the rectangle, then I did the num uh, label. So the text is the element. Uh, text is one type of SVG where we can create some labels and all those stuff. So I created here nine, two, seven, and four. So next is like line. So using lines, I created the access. So mostly we are having here uh, straight access object. Right? There is no curves and nothing. So we can use a normal line. So lines are having four attributes basically x1, y1, x2, y2. So that is like uh, first and uh, like starting and end positions of the axis. So this is one thing. And we can even add a lot of styles to it using style tag here and so on. So by the end, what I'm doing, I have not used any kind of JavaScript library, no other library. So basically using plain HTML and some kind of Python iteration, I am doing this one. So now if you look at the bottom part here, style, just I have done the background as Sam, so I can change this background anytime. So just for example, I'm doing this to yellow, although it will look very weird, but oh, okay, sorry, I didn't use that test over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong there, maybe. Something might be overriding somewhere. Okay, uh, test. Yeah, I'm overriding this with CCCC here. Okay, so I need to add it here. Okay, so it's coming as yellow now. Fine. So basically, CSS we can do a lot of things. So just to show how to use JavaScript and all, I use this one. Just I'm changing the CSS to that particular uh, division to this, or even lot of things we can do. Suppose uh, instead of text, I want to change the color of the rectangle. So just change that one. Uh, it will not be black actually. It will be fill something. So okay. So now it's yellow. So I need to change the background first to make it visible. So it's something like this. So a lot of things we can do using CSS and JavaScript. So if we have all this, we, we have the power to do anything. So even we can make use of bootstrap tool tapes, uh, like um, tool tapes and like mouse overs and uh, enable disable, all those effects. Okay. So this is all why, what I wanted to show for the very intro part of this thing. So I hope it's okay. So if anyone have any questions, so please go ahead with it. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, is there anyone who is willing to ask any questions?
in case anybody has any questions, I would request you to ask Vinay right now. Uh, and, and we'll wait for the next two minutes or so, Vinay. Okay, um, so I believe we don't have any other questions uh, from any of the students. Um, uh, okay, then. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I think at this juncture, uh, 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 so at this juncture, I would like to thank you for your time, Vinay, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you soon once again. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for your time.